Morning, folks. I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School back down here at the Pathfinder Outdoor Classroom. What I thought we'd do is start a series on tanning and preserving hides. We've got a hide tanning class coming up out here at the school. We have another one scheduled in February of next year as well. And what I thought I'd do is I've got some videos already on a lot of these processes that I will copy links to in the description box of this video. I have a three-part series on brain tanning a beaver hide. We use pig brains for that. I want to show you a different form of brain tanning in this series of videos, as well as things like tanning solutions that you can buy commercially and things that you can make around the household or the homestead to be able to tan and preserve hides as well. What I want to talk to you guys about first is understanding that there are five main processes you need to use to tan a hide or preserve a hide. And you can preserve these hides hair on or hair off. And the only difference is how you approach that to remove the hair before the tanning process or whether you want to set the hair before the tanning process. And that's really the difference in those two when you're getting ready to tan hair on or hair off. So those five processes really are flushing the hide. And again, I have videos on my channel that show skinning and flushing. And I'll put some flushing footage in this real quick for you of de-hairing a deer hide with a flushing knife after the hide was flushed and after the hide was soaked. We'll talk about that as we go as well. You have the pickling process and the pickling process really can involve several things, but the pickling process sets the hair and helps to prepare the hide for tanning. You then have a degreasing process that you need to do, especially with things like coons, fox, bear, Hides that are very greasy in general need to be degreased for the tanning solution to be able to soak into the hide itself. So there's a degreasing process for some of these hides. And some of them, you don't really need to worry about it as much. And then we have the tanning process itself, which involves either soaking it or painting some kind of a liquor, tanning liquor on that hide and let it get sit for a certain amount of time to absorb that tanning solution or liquor into the hide itself. And after that, you have to break the hide. And breaking the hide involves a process of basically just stretching and breaking the hide. And this is a coyote hide here that I'm working on now. And it's been tanned. You can see it's soft. It's not hard. But it's got a little bit of stiffness to it still because it hasn't been broken. And in areas where it has been broken fairly well already, you can see when you fluff it up, you can see the breakdown of fibers in there that are occurring to make that an always soft hide or make it so it never gets those crinkles in it again because you're breaking all of that down and you see these things sticking off of it that you'll cut off later that are just pieces of the hide separating and things like that and breaking this hide is the most laborious part of the job to tell you the truth once you skinned it and flushed it this is really the most labor intensive part but once you get it to this stage you can take your time at this and you won't have to sit and do this in one go. You could do this over the course of a week if you chose to, to get this hide to where you want it. And then I'll show you some tricks to breaking the hide too, as far as using breaking stakes and ropes and things like that that we can use to speed this process along, as well as a couple of things we can do with electric devices like a drill and a wire brush to kind of dress the hide up a little bit more, make it more suede-like in the end. We'll talk about that as well. So, it's going to be a fairly involved series because I want to do a brain tanning type solution with you. I want to do some tanning liquors with you and some commercial tanning stuff that's out there as well and show you how that stuff works. Because in the end, what I found is that truly speaking, if you want to tan a hide and you don't want it to be too labor intensive, tanning liquors that are available online are pretty reliable, pretty fast, and much less labor intensive in the end than something like a true brain tanning of a hide. So what we'll do is we'll pick on a small hide for a brain tanning project, like a possum or something that's not going to take a lot of breaking. And that's the problem with brain tanning in general, especially things like deer hides, is that one person is not going to accomplish that very quick and easy. It takes three or four people to be able to stretch and pull that hide and things like that to break it down to make it work better for a brain tanned hide. So why would we want to even learn how to mess with this stuff if it's so labor intensive to begin with? Because obviously the fur market today is in the toilet. That's why not so many people trap anymore as used to because there's really no money involved in trapping anymore. You can't sell furs 
especially raw furs, and make money at it. But what you can do is you can learn to be more self-reliant by understanding how to tan furs. You can also make those tan furs worth quite a bit more money because they're fully tanned. Whereas you might not be able to get 10 bucks for a really nice skinned coyote right now. You could probably get 70 or 80 or even $100 for a really nice, well-tanned, garment quality type coyote right now. So you increase the value dramatically by tanning those hides if you're using them for trade value, if you are trying to sell them somewhere. And then you also have the byproducts of those animals that you can use to make things with. My buddy Kyle Sanborn, he has a colony of beetles that eats the meat off the skulls of animals, basically they traps, so that he can sell the raw skulls because the raw skulls of animals for education, for display, for decor, for crafts, those things are worth quite a bit more money than the hide is themselves right now if they're done correctly. And then you have things like using things like borax to put the feet and things like that into where you can keep those feet dried out and they won't rot anymore. And you can make things out of them. Like I'll give you an example here. I've got a couple of deer feet in borax right now. And when these are dried, I'll just cut them off with a bandsaw. I'll put all thread in them and there'll be a gun rack when they're done to put a gun against a piece of wood. It's going to be a little while. They're not even close to being dried yet, but I've got them in a bucket of just 40 mule team or 20 mule team borax here that you can buy any store and cover them with that borax and just leave them sit. And they're not eating any groceries. It may take three, four months for them to be ready to use, but they're just sitting there working while you're doing other things. And that's part of the advantages to tanning is some of it takes a little bit of time. So if you look at the time it takes to do this, and again, these are round numbers and they're not representative of every single hide because the hides are gonna be more labor intensive and take longer than others. So I'm basing this on an average, like a coyote hide or something like that. You've got 24 to 48 hours between flushing, stretching the hide. And you may choose to stretch it, you may choose to salt it, or you may choose to soak it depending on whether you want a hair on hide or hair off hide and depending on the weather. Ambient temperature makes a big difference. I very rarely ever salt a hide, but most trapping that I do is in colder weather. So most of the tanning work I do is in colder weather. So I will just flush the hide, stretch it onto a stretching rack and hang it up to dry. And then I'll move on to the next step when I'm done. So the main object of today's lesson is going to be pickling making a pickling solution and how we pickle a hide and what that does to the hide. We don't need to pickle the hide if we're trying to remove the hair. In that case, all we need to do is get some wood ash or some lime, mix it with water, you know, five parts water to one part, part lime or five parts uh, water to one part wood ash. Generally, I'm pretty liberal with just guesstimating. I'll take a couple of shovels out of the fire pit into a five gallon bucket of water, mix it up and I'll call that good. Soak a deer hide in that for about 24 to 48 hours. Pull that dude out, especially in cold weather, and it's ready to remove the hair and the hair will shuck right off of it. As you can see in the footage that I'm gonna put in this video, the hair will slide right off of that dude. You don't need to pickle the hide because you're not trying to set the hair. If you're trying to tan a hide with the hair on, which is what we're gonna concentrate on in the first part of this series is, we're going to want to pickle the hide first. So that's where we're gonna start off today is with our pickling solution. All right, so what I thought we'd do first is go through kind of the tools of the trade. These are the tools that you're going to want to begin to process hides. So the first thing you're gonna to have to do is you're going to have to strip the hide from the carcass. And I've got videos on that. Again, it will be in the description box of this video. And we're gonna work with a fox in this. So I'll probably put the fox video attached down here in the link so you guys can find that video on how this fox was skinned, okay? Once that fox is skinned, you're gonna need a flushing board. And this flushing board is just a large piece of hardwood that's pointed on one end. It's nice and smooth and rounded so that you don't tear holes in the hide when you're flushing the hide. You just put the nose on here and you can rotate the hide around. You put it up against a solid object and you lean into it. And this is where you scrape the hide. And you'll see that in the video of me de-herring a hide on this video. Now, you're gonna want some type of an apron probably to keep that stuff off you, to keep all them guts and nasty pieces of flesh and things like that and the blood off of your clothes, unless you just don't care. 
I made this one myself. This is made out of a piece of rubber roof sheeting that I bought a partial roll of from a Lowe's or Menards or something, and I made it. And I just punched the holes in it that I needed for grommets, and I put grommets into it with a grommet setter. And then it's got one piece of rope here that's just got a knot in it to go over my head, just like this. And it's got one waist rope on it here that it can just go all the way around, go through the hole on the other side, and I can just tie a quick half hitch in that. That's slippery so I can get it undone when I want to, just like that. Pull that dude tight and I'm ready. I've got what I need to keep that stuff off my clothes. And because it's made out of this heavy duty rubber material, it's very, very durable. I've had this one for probably, I'm guessing going on now, probably eight years I've had this particular one. I have a video on my channel, probably somewhere in my trapping series on how to make this apron. But this thing is dang near bulletproof. Like I said, it's really heavy rubber roofing material, so it cleans up really easy, and it just works great. So you can buy one commercially, no question about it, or you can make one yourself. I chose to make one myself because I wanted one that was going to last me for a long, long time. Now, once you have this thing on the flushing beam and you have your apron on, you're going to want a flushing knife. And a flushing knife looks kind of like a draw knife, except this edge, this beveled edge, is not sharp at all. And it's got a good flat edge on the other side. They come in different thicknesses, different curvatures. These two are the ones that I rely on 100% of the time. They have a rubber type handle on them. They're easy to clean up. They work very, very well. And depending on the size of the hide, I use one or the other. So I've got two. They're not that expensive. You don't have to buy a real expensive one to get the job done. In fact, a dull draw knife, if you find one, will work. It's just not as conducive because of the way the handles are set up on it. Because as you can see, these handles are straight out instead of straight down. And you want to be able to push against the hide like this, not pull toward you like a draw knife is made to do. So that's a perfect flushing knife in my opinion. That will allow you to get that hide to the point where now you're ready to put it on a rack to stretch and dry it, okay? And racks look like this. They're just a wire rack and they're made for the size animal that you're using them for. This one is a fox stretcher. This is the stretcher that this fox hide just came off of that I had it hanging up on. It's got a couple clips here at the bottom that are friction clips, so you can pull the hide down to stretch it. You put the nose right up here at the top, and you hang it up somewhere in an area that's got good ventilation. That's not too cool if you can help it, although I use winter weather and it doesn't bother me too much out here, especially in December. We're still gonna get into 40 sometimes during the day, but it's gonna drop down below freezing at night. I don't worry too much about that. I just let them hang and they do fine out here. But you can use a controlled environment for this if you want to. Professional guys that do this do use controlled environments with temperatures around that, you know, 40, 50, 60 degree mark all the time, not freezing and things like that, and not too god awful hot with lots of circulation to dry out the hot. All right, Zon, get off of that fox. You're not getting it. Get off of it. Now, the other things that you might want, if I can get this. We're going to stand up here for a minute. I want to fall over for some reason. I'll put it on the side it wants to lean to. A couple other things are hand scrapers. And this one has got a sharp edge, not a sharp edge, but a beveled edge on one side of it here that you can use this as a one-handed scraping tool. Once you've got the hide, the best you can get it with the flushing knife. Sometimes things around the ears, sometimes things around the face are a little more difficult to get off. And don't be afraid to just pick those pieces up and use your knife to cut them off either. Just don't cut the hide, don't cut a hole in the hide. And then this is also another type of hand scraper that you can use to scrape the hide with. These are handy tools to have. They're not absolutes, okay? The one thing that I would say you probably want, and you can use two sticks, you can use two nails, you can use two metal rods, is a tail stripper. A metal tail stripper like this one that's got different sizes in it for the bone of the animal that you're pulling that tail off of during the process of removing it from the carcass will keep you from tearing tails off and ruining what could be a really, really nice hide. So I would highly, highly suggest you invest in something like this. They make them out of plastic as well. I'm just not a fan of things that can break and plastic tends to break. So I like the metal. A comb for the fur. To comb briars and things out of the fur is always a plus to have if you're trying to make a really, really nice hide in the end. And you won't need this until pretty much the very end after you've cleaned it, washed it, and all that stuff. Then you want to start combing it, all right? 
And then I've just got a wooden handle brush here that I can use to apply liquors and things like that to the hide. I also use my hands and a pair of rubber gloves. Just a pair of insulated rubber gloves for the winter. Same ones I use on the trap line most of the time. Just a different pair. They work great for not getting this stuff on your hands. Because some of this stuff you're not going to want on your hands. It's highly acidic. It's got chemicals in it that you don't want on your hands and things like that. And it just kind of keeps them a little bit warmer in the process of doing this in the winter as well. But you can use just some type of a latex glove, like a dish glove that you would use for washing dishes, or even the kind of gloves you use for medical inspection, for first aid and things like that, the nitrile gloves. You can just pull those on, take them off, throw them away. They work fine. We use them a lot out here at the trapping classes and things like that. When we're de-herring hides, when we're flushing hides, when we're stripping hides off carcasses, when we're processing meat, that's the type of gloves we generally use, and they will work fine as well. So when you're done with all of that and you've had your hide stretched, it's going to look like this because what you're going to do is you're going to turn it hair side in to dry out like these are hanging over here in the classroom. I'll just walk you over there real fast. Most of these are hair side out right now or hair side in right now. And you can see that they are drying out. Okay. Once they get to the point that they're fairly dry, you flip them the other direction with the hair side out like that coyote is right there just to let the hair fully dry out and things like that, like we've got on this fox. And now we're ready to take this fox to the next level, which is the pickling process to make sure that we set the hair and get the hide ready for the tanning process. Okay, so I've got a track supply five gallon bucket, about two and a half gallons of water in it. To that, I'm gonna add a whole pound of salt, and this is 26 ounces, so it's way more than a pound. Again, I'm a, one of those kind of guys who's like, okay, that looks good enough to me. I don't necessarily measure all this stuff out. I'm the same way with cooking. I just feel how much is left in there and guess that it's about right and call it good. Now we want a very little bit of bleach and I don't have very much, so that's fine. That's probably enough right there, to be honest with you. Now, Vinegar is something that you do not have to necessarily use, but there are pickling solutions that call for vinegar. I'm going to use it in this one just because I don't use it often and I wanted to give it a shot just to see what the results were. And you should use anywhere from a half to a gallon of this per gallon of water. So I'm going to put this whole gallon in here, which is going to be a little less than a half a gallon per gallon of water. I'm just gonna get this bucket to where it's about three quarters of the way full. So there's a little cost involved in this, but I will also tell you that that coyote hide I showed you a minute ago that I'm working on now was never soaked in some kind of pickling solution. I went straight from drying the hide out on the rack to degreasing and straight to tanning. So. If you don't think your hair is going to fall out and you got to the hide very quickly, and that's really the important thing in the quality of the hide is how fast you got that thing off the carcass once it was dead so no bacteria could grow to make the hair slip, and how fast you got that thing on a rack to dry with the flesh side out so it was drying quickly. And again, bacteria wasn't growing to make the hair slip, all right? I do it pretty quick, so I don't worry about it. With this fox hide, it's a different story. I didn't have full control of this fox hide as I got it from someone else. So I don't know how quick it was taken care of. So I'm gonna use the pickling solution just as an insurance policy to make sure the hair's set. Once you get all that stuff in there, you can stir it. I don't have a stirring device, so I'm just gonna use a flushing knife for that to kind of dissolve that salt in the liquid. What we're going to do is we're going to soak it in here overnight and we're going to come back to it tomorrow and then see if it needs to be degreased after we rinse it out. Again, this is where you might want to be using gloves, depending on what you put in here. I'm going to use gloves just to keep my hands from freezing while I'm soaking this hide. And we're going to want this hide to be down inside here enough that it's covered in fluid. All right, now we're going to take this hide and get it down in this liquid. 
and get it hydrated again. And I'm just kind of squeezing it around in here just to kind of get everything wet. Make sure I don't have any air pockets anywhere in the hide. Just kind of open it up. Kind of flush some liquid down through the tube there. Just to make sure I'm getting everything saturated. Remember, we're trying to set the hair. The importance is that this thing stays submerged. So if we need to put something on top of this to hold the fur down, that's what we're going to do. A good thing for that I've always found is just a weight. Ended up getting my hands wet anyway, but I had to make sure. So, it's a good sign that we don't have a lot of hair floating to the top. That means that the hair's not slipping out of it already. Now we're just gonna let this thing sit overnight and come back to it tomorrow. Okay, so back to the academic portion real quick. This lecithin is the oil that's in a brain that actually makes it a brain tanning solution, okay? This lecithin oil breaks down the enzymes and connective tissue within the hide to help preserve it and make it soft after you break it. The same chemical or the same oil can be found in other places as well as brains like egg yolks. We're gonna talk about egg yolk tanning liquor in this video series because we're gonna tan a possum hide, which is a little easier to handle for one person with eggs so that we can show you that process, okay? It's said that every animal has enough brain to tan its own hide. And one deer brain is enough to tan one deer hide, but it's a stretch, all right? You've gotta be very, very good at what you're doing and have done it a lot of times probably to make that work and be effective the very first time and have enough tanning liquor to get a good tanned hide. So what I would suggest to you is if you want to practice brain tanning, go buy hog brains or something like that from your local butcher or from an Amish community or something like that. Buy hog brains, practice with those first, and then you can actually try a deer brain on a deer hide. However, what we're going to do this weekend, or at least on this first video with this fox, is we're going to use a tanning liquor, a commercial tanning liquor, because I want to make sure this one comes out perfect because it's going to be an example out here at the school. Then later in the series, we'll take a look at brain tanning with egg yolk or oil tanning, I would call it more, with egg yolk on something like a possum hide that's easier to handle than a large skin like a deer. And again, brain tanning videos, I have a series of three brain tanning videos using actual brains to brain tan a beaver hide. If you want to look at those, I'll put those in the description box. I'll put some video links in here to, you know, removing the hide, flushing the hide, things like that, and brain tanning. I'll put all of that stuff in the description box for you so you can find them later. Meanwhile, we're going to give this hide time to soak overnight in our pickling solution. We're going to come back to the degreasing and cleaning portion and get ready to tan this hide. Guys, I appreciate your views. I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, and for our business, all of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.